Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, yep, so my name is Will, and I work for a company called MPC. My job is uh, I'm a motion graphics artist and motion graphics director. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about that in a minute, but first I'm going to explain a little bit about what MPC is and what we do. We're a worldwide company. We have uh, nine studios around the world at the moment doing um, a mixture of things like visual effects for feature films, visual effects for commercials, uh, installations, virtual reality presentations, and uh, even um, applications for iPhone and Android. We're probably best known for our feature film work. This is a still from Disney's uh, The Jungle Book, which we were the principal VFX company on. Uh, what makes this project so interesting is that with the exception of uh, Neil Sethi, who's the um, real-life actor who played uh, the Mowgli character, everything in this film is computer-generated. The grass, the trees, the jungle, the, the characters, everything was made by about 800 artists working over about two years. It's quite impressive. We're doing some more films at the moment. We are uh, working on visual effects and motion graphics for the film Ghost in the Shell, uh, which is an update on that series. Uh, we've finished all the VFX work for the next J.K. Rowling feature, which is called Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. Uh, we also do a lot of advertising work. This is a still from one of my favorite projects. Uh, it's a promo for Channel 4's coverage of the Paralympics. And on this one, we had to uh, create stadiums and backgrounds for uh, about 50 different shots. Uh, this is an ad we just finished for Heineken, featuring um, Jackie Stewart, the Scottish F1 racer. Uh, this was a project involved recreating archive shots by uh, doing a lot of head replacement and that sort of thing. I'm going to show you our advertising reel now, and then I'm going to get into our motion graphics work. Uh, so, thank you very much. Uh, that is our advertising reel. We have a slogan at MPC, kind of a motto. Uh, we craft spectacular visual experiences in any space, on any screen. And that's not just hype. We try to come up with lots of different ways to use our talents uh, to create new and interesting experiences. Uh, one of those is virtual reality, which we do a lot of work in now. This is an um, image from Catatonic, which is what I believe is the first ever virtual reality horror film, a horror experience. Um, they strap you into a wheelchair, you put on the headset, and you go on a very ghoulish tour through a uh, sort of insane asylum. Uh, if you're squeamish, look away now. Um, but this is a, kind of what you see when you're doing this, and um, it's really creepy. Uh, if you ever see it at a, at a festival or something, give it a try. It's, uh, it's very cool. Um, Obviously, we didn't make this painting, but we studied it very carefully. One of our artists used an application called ZBrush, 
and sculpted this uh, painting as a 3D sculpture. So imagining what would happen on the bits that you can't see, looking around the back. We then took this sculpture and 3D printed it. And from these plastic 3D prints, we can create uh, molds. And from those molds, we cast this in bronze and created a full sculpture, kind of a reimagining of the painting. That was part of a project called Transforming, where we looked at a lot of existing art and came up with new and interesting ways to show it. I work in our motion design department. We are a little different from the rest of MPC. We um, are made up of artists who are using some of the same tools and techniques that the other, te other artists are using. But um, we're more interested in design. We're not so interested in making uh, photoreal visual effects. We want to kind of bring our own interpretation to things. Um, I'm going to show you now one film that I think uh, illustrates this quite well. You'll probably recognize the characters, the locations in it, but you'll see that we kind of put our own little spin on it. You will become a great Jedi Knight. Just relax, concentrate. I've got a bad feeling about this. You are the chosen one! Liar! Julie, get us out of here! This is not rescue! I won't fail you. I'm not afraid. You will be. Feel the force of the Star Wars saga. Available now on Sky Movies. Um, so that's a promo for Sky Movies Star Wars Channel, which I designed and led at NBC uh, last year. And you can see how we sort of took something that we already knew very well and tried to make it look a little bit different, feel a bit fresh. Our tools, we use uh, principally Adobe After Effects and Cinema 4D. We use these every day and rely on them quite heavily. And I'm going to show you in a few minutes quite how we integrate those applications and what we do with them. Uh, first, I'm going to show you our motion graphics reel, though, uh, which there'll be some repetition in it, but uh, hopefully you'll see some new stuff. So that's our motion graphics reel. Thank you. Um, you can see we do a pretty big variety of stuff, everything from uh, quite simple graphic projects to pretty fully on realized 3D, 3D environments and character animation. I'm going to uh, talk about a couple of projects in more detail now. Uh, the first one is um, probably an example of the smaller type of project we do. This is a, a charity film that um, I directed and led um, last winter. This uh, had a very low budget and a very small team, so the challenges here were how to pull off uh, something quite quickly without too much work, but also make something that looked good and told a good story. So I'll show you that now and then explain a bit about how we made it. Every day, elephants are being murdered slaughtered in bloody attacks just for their ivory tusks. Ivory destined for a place where red usually means luck. Last year, over 33,000 elephants were killed. If we don't put a stop to the ivory trade now, the next elephant we kill might be the last. 
Let's make 2016 the first ever Chinese year of the elephant. And make sure red means luck, not blood. So this film was uh, a charity project. It was made um, to draw attention to the fact that the ivory trade is very quickly killing elephants. Um, it was meant to be shown at something called the Giants Club Summit, which is a big international meeting of uh, world leaders where they were going to agree to uh, ban the trade of ivory around the world. But it actually started out with a slightly different premise, which was uh, to create a link between um, Chinese New Year and uh, the killing of elephants. Basically, uh, an ad agency called Grey London came to us and said, uh, how can you help us tell this story about how um, China, in China, people are still buying ivory, and around uh, Chinese New Year, people are exchanging gifts of money, and people are using that, in some cases, to buy ivory. Uh, and they had this idea that we would link the color red, which in China stands for, or I believe around New Year's means good luck, uh, and the red of elephant blood. So we thought about this. We knew we didn't have a lot of time and a lot of resources to make it. So we started doing some research. And the first thing we did was just started pulling some images of things we thought we might like to copy or to bring into, a, into the project. And um, as you can see here, the first thing we looked at was a lot of uh, photoreal CG blood. Um, and we thought about this for a little while and then realized uh, for a couple of reasons we couldn't do this. One was we just didn't have the time that it would take to pull something like this off. Um, the other is that actually we didn't think it was the right way to tell this story. It was just, there just wasn't something, there was something wasn't right about using kind of photoreal CG in this case. So I sat down and very quickly did some rough sketches uh, of something completely different, something much more graphic and simple. And um, these are sort of a just ink and stamp kind of look. And um, I mean, I quite like this sort of style. Uh, you know, when I work at MPC, we tend to make a lot of really slick 3D CG. It's nice now and then to make something that looks a bit more folky, um, a little less uh, uh, polished. We sent these off with some stills like these to our client and said, you know, we're thinking of making something that's not going to be, uh, you know, CG. It's not going to be really complex. And they said, yeah, great. We'd like that. And uh, we think that would work really well. And in fact, you don't have to go that complex. You can make it even simpler. Um, so now we had a little bit of a problem as I'd sold this kind of handmade look. But I had uh, about eight days and only myself and one other person uh, available to work on the project. So I had to come up with a, a way to make this thing, make it look handmade in the time we had. So I looked around on the internet a little bit, and um, I saw this thing called uh, Feral, which is a um, really nice animated film by a guy called Daniel Souza. And he made this video showing how he made it. And what he did was he started off in Flash, doing his animation uh, in a digital way, just using the digital tools to make the kind of building blocks of this thing. And then he added hand-drawn pen strokes by printing things out and scanning them. Um, and it just builds up layers of handmade uh, or hand technique, which just makes the whole thing feel quite, um, quite lovingly made and quite beautiful. So I thought about this and wondered if there was a way I could quickly replicate this idea. And uh, I figured, well, the best way I can do that is to use the application I know best, which is Cinema 4D. And so I brought in an elephant, and I rigged it. And uh, that's what this uh, joint chain is. Um, this is incredibly easy to do in Cinema 4D, and I did it very quickly. Uh, added some controls so that I could um, use an IK system on it. And um, I did this very, very crude animation of an elephant falling. And um, it's probably the worst character animation that's ever come out of our studio, but for this, it was good enough. In fact, I didn't want a lot of detail. I just wanted something quite simple. From that, I did probably one of the worst 3D renders that's ever come out of our studio. Um, but again, it was just what I needed in order to kind of build up uh, this look I was after. So I take this animation into an application called Studio Artist, uh, which is a really interesting program. It's, um, I don't think a lot of people know about it, but it adds up uh, paint layers on top of your image, um, but not in a normal way, not the way a plugin might do it, but actually by kind of analyzing your image and stroking paint on top of it. And um, it's fiddly, it's hard to get the look you're after every time. It depends on the scale of your shot, and it takes a while to get right. But once you get it right, you can 
run your shots through it in a sequence, and it will put them back out as new frames for you. So once we've done that, we took it into Photoshop. We added um, another layer of hand-painted strokes, just to give it a little more detail and a little more texture. Brought that into After Effects, added some, um, some uh, flicker and some shake, and we quantized the frame rate so it felt a little bit more like a hand-animated film. And you get something that looks like this. Obviously, one thing that was really useful was to be able to replicate the elephant. So we had five or six elephants that were all basically the same initial animation. We just turned them and rotated them and saw them in different ways. The next thing I needed to do was come up with a way to create the blood and the uh, splashes when the elephants hit the ground and the collapsing elephants. And um, for the blood, I uh, used a tool called RealFlow. And there's a theme here. This is probably the worst fluid simulation ever done in RealFlow. But they were very quick to do. And they did exactly what I wanted, which was create these kind of um, quite, quite creepy uh, blood splashes. I brought these into, uh, sorry, no. I needed to animate my falling elephants. And I wanted my elephants to do something interesting when they hit the ground, not just bounce. I looked at hand animating it. It didn't look very good. So I did some soft body dynamics. Obviously, again, not a very good simulation, but just what I needed for this. Um, we get lots of kind of elephants which look like sort of big bags of gas as they hit the, air, uh, hit the ground and they collapse. Once I do this, take all this into the system, put it through Photoshop, put it through After Effects again, you get something that looks like this. One shot I really wanted to pull off was this shot showing just how many elephants were involved in this. So I've shown five or six elephants falling. I wanted to show the full number, which according to our script was 33,000 elephants being killed a year. And so in this scene, we actually have 33,000 elephants. Um, these are layers built up in Photoshop. But then uh, using the tools inside C4D, the cloning tools, I actually created layers of as I calculated, about 33,000 elephants. Um, you can see them there in the background. Those are just C4D clones, five or six different elephants, repeated over and over and over again. And then in the foreground, what I have what I call hero element elephants, which are ones I've just drawn in on top of that. I think my favorite shot in the whole sequence is this one. Um, my colleague, Matthew Campbell, uh, I asked him to come up with a way to depict the um, blood trail coming out of the tusk of the elephant. Obviously, when elephants are killed, they're killed because it's so difficult to remove their tusks. So otherwise, um, the hunters would just take their tusks. Um, but I wanted to create a kind of symbolic gesture here that the blood was coming out from where the ivory tusk would have been. Uh, so Matt worked in um, After Effects in uh, using a plugin called Trap Code Particular and created this uh, really beautiful blood trail which I think, you know, I really like this image because I think it's quite moving and it reminds me a little bit of um, some of the stencil art by Banksy. It's just, um, it's simple, but I think it tells the story really well. Uh, so that's uh, one project. That's the um, Wild Eight Elephants project. I'm going to jump over to another one now. So I just showed you a very small project made by two people myself and another artist working for a very short period of time. Now I'm going to show you something that involved a very large team working for several months. Um, I'm going to show it to you now, and then I'll just talk you through the process of how we made it.
every day. So this project was a collaboration. Uh, and on the left, you see the director, a guy called Darren Rabinovich, who is um, uh, kind of known for this style of combining lots of different types of media in his, in his project, great kind of puppet characters over interesting sort of illustrated or quirky backgrounds. Um, he directs commercials. He's directed pop promos for Bjork. Um, and he was the kind of principal creative behind this whole project. Then on the right, you have two guys who worked in our studio. Uh, their names are Tom and Steve, and they call them Steven, and they call themselves H-Block. And they were kind of uh, collaborating with Darren within our studio, um, kind of being a, a sort of creative connection to all the people working uh, as part of our team. On top of them, I think we had around eight compositors, um, five or six 3D artists, uh, four or five map painters, and a team behind the scenes who do things like roto paint and clean up as well. So it was a much bigger uh, team, bigger production than the last one. Just to give you an idea of, kind of how we make something like this, these are Darren's early concept boards. If you look carefully at the uh, images here, you can see they're color-coded, so they show, you, they show you where things are going to come from. So the green, that represents things that we're actually going to shoot live action. The um, blue and uh, the orange are, are mid and background matte paintings. And then um, all the uh, pink, where you see it, or the purple, that's... Um, that's going to be rendered 3D that we're going to all put into one thing together. Um, this is the first thing we actually saw of the project. This is a director's treatment, and this came from Darren. It might be interesting for you to see what, how these things look. As far as treatments go, this is probably one of the, the most interesting and the most thorough I've ever seen. Um, right off the bat, we see Darren's thinking about how we're actually going to make this thing. Which it, sometimes directors have ideas, but they have no idea how the process is going to work. Darren knew exactly how it was going to work. You can see how he's thought about how you're going to combine green screen live action uh, with different types of media, um, rendered CG, and map paintings. Darren uh, has great ideas, and he's quite clear at getting them across. He knows what he wants, and he knows um, when it's not what he wants. So he uh, gave us these environment images to work with. It was really interesting to see kind of how the different scales were going to work together. These are some of his uh, ideas for the characters and some of the costumes he's made in the past. And um, you know, we're quite inspired by stuff like this. It just looks really different and interesting. Um, some more kind of set reference. One thing Darren wanted to bring across in this was the set was going to be a bit like a character. It wasn't just going to be this kind of thing in the background. So um, like this log plume ride here, he really wanted to bring out some kind of a sense of a, almost a personality in the environment. Uh, this is the mood board. Um, we had a great time with this. We were trying to figure out where all these references come from. And um, we, you know, we named uh, Never Ending Story, Buck Rogers, Where the Wild Things Are, uh, Wizard of Oz. But some of them we couldn't even figure out. But um, you know, when you're artists like us and we work in, we, you know, we love films and we, we love animation, when a director comes and shows you all these kind of references, you get pretty excited and think this is going to be a fun project. Um, lighting is really important on a project like this when you're combining different sources from uh, you know, live action and um, uh, CG it's really important that you have an idea of what your lighting's going to be like, so that when you shoot the live action, you can match that later in your CG. So you need to know the, the direction where the light's coming from, how intense is it, what time of day is it, what color is the light. These are all you know, really useful things to know when you go into a project. Um, I'm going to show you now the previs. So this is what um, Darren, worked, uh, Darren created with um, some MPC artists working in New York. And um, oops, I haven't pressed play yet. So previs is obviously a very crude depiction of what the thing's gonna, film's actually going to look like. Um, the animation is done very roughly on purpose, and there's no real intention here to create anything that looks great. You're just showing everyone you, how you imagine things like the shot duration, uh, the camera. Um, particularly interesting, useful for us as uh, artists is to understand the different scales we're going to be working at because when you create something for a close-up shot, it's very different from something that you create for a, a long distance background shot. We also take some of these elements into C4D 
especially the camera, and we actually start using these elements for our first rough animation. So prior to shooting, uh, they had to build all the live action props and costumes. Um, now again, you know, when artists like us, we work in digital, uh, when you see people doing this kind of stuff, getting their hands dirty, oh, making these uh, you know, really beautiful, detailed characters, uh, it's really inspiring for us. Um, and sometimes we're a bit envious, really. These people are kind of you know, so skilled, so good at crafting things. Um, and they get such beautiful detail out of it all. Um, I like this image for a lot of reasons, but particularly I like the uh, person's shoes. They just seem so uh, incongruous with the rest of the picture. Uh, of course, these costumes have to fit people inside, and um, that turned out to be quite a challenge to get um, these costumes uh, in a way, uh, built in a way that you could wear them and actually perform inside them. I'll get to more of that in a minute. Here's the robot being built. Um, I put this image in just because it's so weird. I really like it. Uh, OK, blue screen. So this is a blue screen shoot. It's a chroma key shoot. We're going to, in post-production, separate out the blue screen and build our own environments. Um, whenever you do this, you have to decide what color you're going to shoot your backdrop, because that's going to be the color that you're going to pull out. So if you have anything else in your film that's blue, that's going to get pulled out at the same time, and you have to paint that back in. We chose blue screen because we had so much um, grass and other things um, that were green, that were so detailed, that there was no way we were going to actually hand remove those things. Unfortunately, our robot character was bright, uh, bright blue, and that meant that he would have to be manually cut out of the film. That's Darren looking out over his world. Um, I put this in because I think it shows just how much work goes into this stuff. This guy is making uh, grasses one little flower at a time. OK, here's one of our actors. These are circus performers, and they were hired because they um, should be good at working on cables, and they're not afraid of heights. Um, and we hoped that we would be able to get a good performance in these costumes. It kind of turned out that the mixture of the costumes and the type of harnesses uh, made it virtually impossible for them to actually control their performance uh, once they started doing it. So once they got on their harnesses, they were basically just dangling there. And um, they had to, on set, come up with other ways to control their movement just to stop them from spinning. And that became pretty important because basically it was very difficult for them to act. And um, you'll see in a minute how that had an impact on the post-production. There's a robot. As I said before, he's blue. The background's blue, which means I mean, he's, in fact, almost perfectly blue. Um, whenever we apply a uh, keying effect to try to extract our background, he's going to go with it. So what we do is apply a team of artists to hand rotoscope the frames to paint him out of that background so that we can control that. This is the, pre uh, sorry, this is the first offline edit. So the director, Darren, finished uh, shooting, went, came to London and went to um, a post house near us and started cutting his film together. Um, once we saw it, we knew we had a bit of a problem. If you look carefully at some of the shots of the robot, you'll notice that he's actually made up of multiple takes. And what happened is, in the offline edit, the director and the offline editor decided that in order to get the performance out of the robot and some of the other characters that they wanted, they actually had to stitch together different pieces. So you can imagine the way this guy is built is actually an arm from one take, another arm from another take, maybe a lower body from another take. So what that meant for us is that not only did we have to extract multiple takes from the background, so much more rotoscoping work, but we also had to stitch together these plates seamlessly so that one arm from one take fit onto the shoulder from another take. It's a lot of work. And our compositing team did a pretty amazing job at it. Um, so now we get to start our, our work. This is all now happening at MPC in London. Um, these are a series of map paintings. These in particular are by our artist Michelle Tolo. And you can see she's going through, just adding more detail into the, uh, the background, kind of trying to get her, her head around how to achieve the look that Darren is after. You can see more and more grass texture, um, more rock texture. 
you know, sort of building up this world as she sees it, and hopefully as Darren sees it. Um, Darren uh, had his thoughts about this. These are his notes on the uh, first go at the map painting. Um, if you look up at the top right, uh, you can see he found a little bit he liked. He wrote nice. <laughs> Everything else, he had some ideas about how to change. Um, this is, for us, an interesting quandary because um, it's great to have directors who really know what they want. They might be very exacting. They might say, you've got to keep going and keep going. But at least they're giving us really clear ideas about what they're after. And they're pushing us to do better work. So that's quite inspiring in the long run. It just means some days can feel quite long. Um, these are Michelle's uh, reactions to Darren's notes. And you can see she um, pretty soon got pretty close to what he was after. OK, clouds were going to be a big part of this film. And Darren was very clear about how he wanted them to look. And we had to figure out how to make these clouds work in three dimensions. So these are all rendered inside Cinema 4D using a plugin called Turbulence FD. And um, you can see we're looking at things like what happens when you get really close to them. Do the, does the detail hold up? What happens when you fly very fast through them? How long do they take to render? What kind of different looks can we get out of this sort of thing? How do you make different types of clouds? How do you get wispy ones and really uh, crunchy ones? What happens when they move? These are all things that we needed to, uh, to test early on. And we got some initial feedback from Darren. And he was saying, well, what I want to do is have a little bit more variety in here. And so these are kind of really wispy clouds that we created. And we said, OK, Darren, we've got these really puffy clouds. And then we've got sort of hybrid clouds that are wispy on the bottom and puffy on the top. I thought, are we, are we getting close here? Um, no, we weren't getting close. So uh, he made some sketches. You can see he made this on our MPC stationery. And he just sat with one of our artists, uh, I believe it was Tom, and just sketched out these shapes and said, I want my clouds to look like this. And this is what we came up with. And um, these kind of weird octopus kind of shaped clouds. And this is what he wanted. So we made, uh, I think, about uh, 10 of these. And we call them hero clouds. And these are actual renders of a 3D object. So one really cool thing when you do this in 3D is that once you get a shape you really like, it's not too difficult to just spin it a little bit, scale it a little bit, or flip it. And you get what feels like a new, different cloud. So from those hero clouds, we started building up a composite like this. So you can see we've rendered some of the clouds. And those go as 2D objects in the back. And we've kept some of the clouds as 3D objects. And they stay up in the foreground, really getting close to the camera. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so that's kind of how we approached building that stuff. Just to give you an idea of how this works inside Cinema 4D, this is uh, using the plugin called Turbulence FD. And um, this is what Tom called his cloud machine. And what he did was use Demograph setup that allowed him to clone several different shapes, these spheres, and then he could move them around, create new kind of base clouds. Those shapes become emitters from which turbulence emits uh, gases. Turbulence, by the way, if you don't use it, is very good for creating uh, clouds, smoke, flames, explosions, any of that kind of um, uh, gaseous, gaseous stuff. Uh, it's quite fun to use. It gives you a lot of different options to uh, create kind of puffy stuff, crunchy stuff. Um, renders very quickly inside C4D. It's a slightly different version of the same idea. To create the little wispy clouds, we needed to emit from a texture. So we take this little plane, we put a cloudy texture on it, that emits the wispy ones, and then we add the puffy clouds on top. And when you render it, you get these really nice, kind of hybrid, cool clouds. One thing I really like about this project is the sort of mixed media feel about it. So we have uh, a photo reel, well, we have a real live action shoot. We have map paintings, which are quite stylistic. Uh, we have these slightly realistic clouds. And then we have these um, kind of robot trails when the uh, robot's um, rocket engines kick in. And these are very graphic. They're almost like something from a, a Tex Avery cartoon. And um, these were created by our artist, Matthew Campbell, working uh, mainly in Cinema 4D using X particles. And um, as you can see, he just did a lot of experimentation, trying out different ideas, um, and came up with this just really cool kind of graphic look for that stuff.
probably one of the biggest technical challenges in doing this was the sequence where the characters run along a road. We needed the road to move beneath them, a bit like a treadmill. And um, that meant, obviously, we couldn't have a real road, because um, it wouldn't work like a big treadmill. Um, so we had to replicate the set exactly. And um, this meant basically working inside Cinema 4D and building a complete recreation of this bit of the set. So there you can see that going by. Let's go back to that for a second. Sorry, guys. Just wanted to lock on to that shot. This is our 3D set. You can see uh, we've got lots of road. It's a bit bumpy. We put some rocks in. The uh, grass is rendered in a couple of different ways. We're using uh, C4D hair, um, which is obviously a system made for generating hairs, but it also works extremely well for creating grass. It's, um, you can also see some cards there. Those will, be, um, those will have alpha textures on them. Uh, we call those um, billboards or baseball cards. Um, and they will face pretty much to the camera, and they'll kind of add up the detail in the scene. Um, we rendered the scene using uh, Arnold Render inside C4D, and that was basically because of all our options. It gave us the most realistic and um, the, op the, kind of the look that matched the set the best. Uh, it's the first time we ever used Arnold on a project, and it worked really well. We did all this. We created this uh, beautiful scene, beautiful animation. And um, then it went into the composite, and it got motion blurred so much, you can barely see it. Um, but we were very pleased with how it turned out. That's kind of the detail. I'm going to uh, show you a quick making of film, which shows you kind of how all these different layers come together. Um, and then uh, I'm going to move on to one more project. OK, that's uh, IKEA Fly Robot Fly. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, on behalf of the people who mainly did that, thank you very much. Um, one more project quickly talk about. So those were visual effects projects that were made for commercials to be shown on television and online. This is quite different, this one. Uh, it's an installation, and it was uh, for a shop window uh, at Harrods in London. 
we made this uh, collaboration with our digital department. We have a kind of interesting uh, relationship with our digital department. We do lots of work for them that then gets integrated into other things. So, for instance, um, last year we made uh, helped them make an app for uh, iPhone and Android uh, to support the uh, TV show X Factor in the UK. Basically, it was an app where you record yourself singing on your mobile phone, and then we composite you into all kinds of different environments and create these pop promos, and then the app can automatically submit these to the TV show, and if they like them, they'll show them on the TV that week. Um, our job on this was to create the template scenes, which would then be used to uh, go into the app and could be live rendered by the app and then fed out again. So we did that using C4D and After Effects. Okay, so this one was a project with the digital department, a little bit different. Uh, this was for um, Hennessy Cognac, uh, and it was to, I think, celebrate um, an anniversary of Hennessy. The inspiration for this job came from a few places. Um, one was from something that we did a few years prior to this for uh, McLaren, and uh, this is an installation. Um, basically, what you're seeing here is all captured in camera. There's no kind of special visual effects being added on top of it. Um, we've got this... Uh, TV screen, monitor moving along a track very quickly and um, displaying images. Then we record this with a long exposure and you get this kind of beautiful uh, 3D sculpture of a McLaren automobile. So another reference for this project, um, which became the kind of the building block of this project, um, is this thing called, uh, or this project called uh, Full Turn, which is done by a student artist uh, in Switzerland, a guy called Benjamin Muzzin. It's basically two iPads strapped back to back, playing an animation. They start spinning around very fast, and when they do, they create these kind of beautiful 3D shapes um, that when you're standing in front of it, feel quite um, kind of beautiful and light, like holograms. Uh, so we showed this to our client, to Hennessy, and they said, yes, we would like to do something very similar to that. So we contacted Benjamin and we said, would you be interested in working with us on this as a consultant? He said, absolutely. And so that was kind of it. We thought, well, great, this is going to be simple. Um, then turned out to be quite complicated. There's a big difference between having two iPads spinning around on a table uh, and comparing that to two 22-inch LED screens spinning around at high speed uh, in a shop window for 14 hours a day for up to two months. Uh, there's massive differences in the weight um, the, the sort of safety requirements. Um, it turned out to be quite a big engineering project. It sort of went from being a design project or a digital one to being um, quite a physical engineering project. We brought on an engineering company to help us build this thing, and you just get an idea of how this uh, contraption works. Um, notice that even without the screens applied, this thing needs weight to make sure that it stays in position. And here it is. Um, with some of our early animation playing on top of it or inside it. You get an idea of kind of how, what this thing's going to look like when this stuff starts spinning around. But we noticed that um, it's very difficult to kind of get an idea of what our animation is going to look like unless you're actually standing right in front of this thing. Even trying to capture it on video is quite tricky. It doesn't really have that kind of beautiful long exposure feel like that you'll get when you're actually standing in front of it. So we brought the thing into our office, and um, we put it in a secure room or in a glass case because it was quite lethal and you didn't want to get anywhere near it. Um, and we started doing some tests just to get a sense better of how this worked. Um, unfortunately, after a few weeks, we had to give the whole device back to the engineers so they could finish building it. Meanwhile, we were working on our animation, what was going to go into it. And you can see, when you just look at it on a flat screen, it doesn't look like much. And it was proving very difficult to understand what we were going to get. We needed to come up with some way in our studio of seeing how this was going to look when it was finished. Um, we tried a few different things. Probably the most hilarious is um, this drill, drill press meets iPad uh, simulator that um, one of our artists built. And we brought this into the basement of MPC, rigged it up on a drill press, and um, you basically stand in front of this thing and hope that it's not going to come flying off and hit you in the face. Um, it worked, kind of, but it still didn't really give us an idea of what we were going to get. We needed to come up with a much better, consistent way of seeing what we were going to be doing. 
One, pro one thing that we noticed in particular is that the distance between the two screens had a big impact on the shape of the images that were created. So we're making this bottle for Hennessy. It's very important that the bottle has the right shape. Obviously, you can't get that wrong. Um, but this distance between the screens either stretched or shrank the width of the bottle. Um, so we needed to know really what we were going to get. Otherwise, this wasn't going to work. So I did some tests in our studio with uh, different 3D software. And I mainly used Cinema 4D and lots of different renderers. And um, in particular, found that the Arnold render could actually simulate this really well and could create the kind of uh, curving motion blur that we really needed to see to understand what we were going to get. And this process turned out to be really fast. We could uh, very quickly build up our animation in After Effects and very quickly see what it was going to look like uh, when it was rendered in our scene. Um, so that was kind of a, a bit of a, a saving grace for us because it meant that we could actually um, show the client as well what they were going to get in these screens without having to show them the actual installation. So that was pretty much all the design done. Now we had to install this thing. Uh, we took it to Harrods, took all the different bits and pieces. Um, Harrods have a policy that when you're installing something in their window, that you have a curtain down. And obviously, they don't want people from the street seeing you playing around in there. But it meant that the very first time that we ever saw our animation was also the very first time that the public saw it. So it was a bit like, you know, let's hope this works. <laughs> um, but we unveiled it, and we opened up. Um, uh, I believe in uh, sometime in December. Here you can see the, uh, the whole window. Um, there's a door over here. And um, one of the safety policies was that that door, if it were opened, would automatically shut off the whole device so that when people came in in the evenings to clean, um, they wouldn't get hurt by this thing. Um, unfortunately, often uh, someone would come in, clean, shut the door, and no one came along and turned the machine back on. So we'd often get calls from uh, people saying, you know your uh, spinning thing down in uh, Knightsbridge, it's not spinning. Um, here's some video of it in action. Again, it's difficult to get the impression, really, from, from this, but um, you can see it here. Um, one other interesting thing is we were told by the engineers that we should probably ask Harrods to reinforce the glass in their window. And they said, that's not necessary. Our windows have been bulletproof for about 20 years. It is one more time. Uh, this is sort of, you, know, you can see it with uh, people fascinated as they walk by, checking it out. Um, I'll just jump ahead to when it actually starts spinning. There it goes. Yeah. Glorious with the reflection of Top Shop in the uh, window there. And that is our Hennessy project. And that's uh, all the projects I'm going to show you today. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you for everyone who watched online. Um, I'll be here for a few minutes. If anyone wants to ask any questions, uh, ask now if you like, or I'll be standing around a little bit later. But thank you very much. Thank you.